As soon as General Grant obtained accurate information in regard to the circumstances and conditions at Fort Fisher, he decided to send another expedition and to put it in charge of an efficient officer and one who could be trusted implicitly to carry out his instructions. As there had been a lack of precaution on the part of the officers engaged in the previous expedition to keep the movement secret, the general-in-chief at first communicated the facts regarding the new expedition to only two persons at headquarters. Of course, he had to let it be known to the Secretary of War, but as the Secretary was always reticent about such matters, there was a reasonable probability that the secret could be kept. Directions were given which tended to create the impression that the vessels were being loaded with supplies and reinforcements for Sherman's army, and studious efforts were made to throw the enemy off his guard. Of course, everyone who knew the general's tenacity of purpose felt sure that he would never relinquish his determination to take Fort Fisher and would immediately take steps to retrieve the failure which had been made in the first attempt. And as soon as Butler returned, I suggested to the general that, in case another expedition should be sent, General A. H. Terry would be, for many reasons, the best officer to be placed in command. We had served together in the Sherman DuPont expedition, which in 1861 took Hilton Head and captured Fort Pulaski and other points on the Atlantic coast. And I knew him to be the most experienced officer in the service in embarking and disembarking troops upon the sea coast looking after their welfare on transports, and entrenching rapidly on shore. General Grant had seldom come in contact with Terry personally, but had been much pleased at the manner in which he had handled his troops in the movements on the James River. A suggestion, too, was made that as Terry was a volunteer officer, and as the first expedition had failed under a volunteer, it would only be fair that another officer of that service, rather than one from the regular army, should be given a chance to redeem the disaster. The general seemed to listen with interest to what was said about Terry, particularly as to his experience in seacoast expeditions, but gave no hint at the time of a disposition to appoint him, nor did he even say whether he would send another expedition to Fort Fisher. But on January 2nd, he telegraphed to Butler, Please send Major General Terry to City Point to see me this morning. Grant considered the propriety of going in person with the expedition, but his better judgment did not approve such a course, for he would be too far out of reach of communication with City Point, and as Butler was the senior army commander, it would leave him in supreme command of the armies operating against Petersburg and Richmond. When Terry came, the general-in-chief told him simply that he had been designated to take command of a transfer by sea of 8,000 men, and that he was to sail under sealed orders. Terry felt much complimented that he should be singled out for such a command, but had no idea of his destination, and was evidently under the impression that he was to join Sherman. On January 5th, Terry was ready to proceed to Fort Monroe, and Grant accompanied him down the James River for the purpose of giving him his final instructions. After the boat had proceeded some distance from City Point, the general sat down with Terry in the after-cabin of the steamer, and there made known to him the real destination and purposes of the expedition. He said, The object is to renew the attempt to capture Fort Fisher, and in case of success to take possession of Wilmington. It is of the greatest importance that there should be a complete understanding and harmony of action between you and Admiral Porter. I want you to consult the admiral fully, and to let there be no misunderstanding in regard to the plan of cooperation in all its details. I served with Admiral Porter on the Mississippi and have a high appreciation of his courage and judgment. I want to urge upon you to land with all dispatch and entrench yourself in a position from which you can operate against Fort Fisher and not to abandon it until the fort is captured or you receive further instructions from me. Full instructions were carefully prepared in writing and handed to Terry on the evening of January 5th, and captains of the transports were given sealed orders not to be opened until the vessels were off Cape Henry. The vessels soon appeared off the North Carolina coast. A landing was made on January 13th, and on the morning of the 14th, Terry had fortified a position about two miles from the fort. The Navy, which had been firing upon the fort for two days,
began another bombardment at daylight on the 15th. That afternoon, Ames's division made an assault on the work. 2,000 sailors and marines were also landed for the purpose of making a charge. They had received an order from the admiral, in the wording of which facetiousness in nautical phraseology could go no further. It read, Board the fort in a seaman-like manner. They made a gallant attack, but were met with a murderous fire and did not gain the work. Ames's division, with Curtis's brigade in advance, overcame all efforts of the defenders, and the garrison was driven from one portion of the fort to another in a series of hand-to-hand -hand contests in which individual acts of heroism surpassed almost anything in the history of assaults upon well-defended forts. The battle did not close until ten o'clock at night. Then the formidable work had been fairly won. The garrison was taken prisoners. The mouth of the Cape Fear River was closed, and Wilmington was at the mercy of our troops. The trophies were 169 guns, over 2,000 stands of small arms, large quantities of ammunition and commissary stores, and more than 2,000 prisoners. About 600 of the garrison were killed or wounded. Terry's loss was 110 killed, 536 wounded, and 13 missing. After the news of the capture of the fort was received, I was sent there by General Grant with additional instructions to Terry, and upon my arrival I could not help being surprised at the formidable character of the work. No one without having seen it could form an adequate conception of the almost insurmountable obstacles which the assaulting columns encountered. During the summer, General Butler, who was always fertile in ideas, had conceived the notion that there were many advantages to be gained by making a canal across a narrow neck of land known as Dutch Gap on the James River, which would cut off four and three-quarter miles of river navigation. This neck was about 174 yards wide. The name originated from the fact that a Dutchman had many years before attempted a similar undertaking, but little or no progress had been made. The enterprise involved the excavation of nearly 80,000 cubic feet of earth. Butler had been somewhat reluctantly authorized to dig the canal, and work upon it had been begun on August 10th. The enemy soon erected heavy rifle guns, and afterward put mortars in positions which bore upon it. And our men were subjected to a severe fire, and frequently had to seek shelter in dugouts constructed as places of refuge. Under the delays and difficulties which arose, the canal was not finished until the end of the year. On the 31st of December, General Grant received a message from Butler saying, We propose to explode the heading of Dutch Gap at 11 a.m. tomorrow. I should be happy to see yourself and friends at headquarters. We must be near the time because of the tide. The General-in-Chief replied, Do not wait for me in your explosion. I doubt my ability to be up in the morning. After the bulkhead wall of earth had been blown out, the debris at the north end was partly removed by means of steam dredges. The canal was not of any service during the war, but it has since been enlarged and improved, and has become the ordinary channel for the passage of vessels plying on the James River. General Grant had become very tired of discussing methods of warfare which were like some of the problems described in algebra as more curious than useful, and he was not sufficiently interested in the canal to be present at the explosion which was expected to complete it. About this time, all the cranks in the country, besides men of real inventive genius, were sending extraordinary plans and suggestions for capturing Richmond. A proposition from an engineer was received one day, accompanied by elaborate drawings and calculations which had evidently involved intense labor on the part of the author. His plan was to build a masonry wall around Richmond, of an elevation higher than the tallest houses, then to fill the enclosure with water pumped from the James River, and drown out the garrison and people like rats in a cage. The exact number of pumps required and their capacity had been figured out to a nicety. Another inventive genius, whose mind seemed to run in the direction of the science of chemistry, and the practice of sternutation, sent in a chemical formula for making an all-powerful snuff. In his communication, he assured the commanding general that after a series of experiments he had made with it on people and animals, 
He was sure that if shells were filled with it and exploded within the enemy's lines, the troops would be seized with such violent fits of sneezing that they would soon become physically exhausted with the effort, and the Union Army could walk over at its leisure and pick them up as prisoners without itself losing a man. A certain officer had figured out from statistics that the James River froze over about once in seven years, and that this was the seventh year, and advised that troops be massed in such a position that when the upper part of the James changed from a liquid to a solid, columns could be rushed across it on the ice to a position in rear of the enemy's lines, and Richmond would be at our mercy. A sorcerer in Rochester sent the general word that he had cast his horoscope, and gave him a clear and unclouded insight into his future, and added to its general attractiveness by telling him how gloriously he was going to succeed in taking Richmond. One evening the general referred to these emanations of the prolific brains of our people, and the many novel suggestions made to him, beginning with the famous powder boat sent against Fort Fisher, and closed the conversation by saying, This is a very suggestive age. Some people seem to think that an army can be whipped by waiting for rivers to freeze over, exploding powder at a distance, drowning out troops or setting them to sneezing, but it will always be found in the end that the only way to whip an army is to go out and fight it. On January 4th, General Grant had written to the Secretary of War, asking that Butler might be relieved, saying, I am constrained to request the removal of General Butler from the command of the Department of Virginia and North Carolina. I do this with reluctance, but the good of the service requires it. In my absence, General Butler necessarily commands, and there is a lack of confidence felt in his military ability, making him an unsafe commander for a large army. His administration of the affairs of his department is also objectionable. Learning that the Secretary of War had gone to Savannah to visit General Sherman and could not receive this letter in due time, on January 6th, the General telegraphed to the President asking that prompt action be taken in the matter. The order was made on the 7th, and on the morning of the 8th, General Grant directed Colonel Babcock and me to go to General Butler's headquarters, announce the fact to him, and hand him the written order relieving him from command. We arrived there about noon, found the general in his camp, and by his invitation went with him into his tent. He opened the communication, read the order, and was silent for a minute. Then he began to manifest considerable nervousness, and turning to his desk wrote, Received on the envelope, dated it 1864 instead of 1865, and handed it back. It was the custom in the army to return envelope receipts in case of communications delivered by enlisted men, but this was omitted when the instructions were transmitted by staff officers. He was politely reminded that a written receipt was not necessary. Thereupon, in a somewhat confused manner, he uttered a word or two of apology for offering it, and after a slight pause added, Please say to General Grant that I will go to his headquarters and would like to have a personal interview with him. General Grant was in constant correspondence with Sherman in regard to the movements in the Carolinas. Sherman was to move north, breaking up all lines of communication as he advanced. If Lee should suddenly abandon Richmond and Petersburg and move with his army to join the Confederate forces in the Carolinas with a view to crushing Sherman, that officer was to whip Lee if he could, and if not to fall back upon the sea coast. Grant was to hold Lee's army where it was, if possible, and if not, to follow it up with vigor. Sherman's triumphant march to the sea had gained him many admirers in the North, and it was believed about this time that a bill might be introduced in Congress, providing for his promotion to the grade of lieutenant general, which would make him eligible to command the armies in case he should be assigned to such a position. On January 21st, he said in a letter to General Grant, I have been told that Congress meditates a bill to make another lieutenant general for me. I have written to John Sherman to stop it if it is designed for me. It would be mischievous, for there are enough rascals who would try to sow differences between us, whereas you and I now are in perfect understanding. I would rather have you in command than anybody else for you are fair, honest, and have at heart the same purpose that should animate all. I should emphatically decline any commission calculated to bring us into rivalry, General Grant replied.
No one would be more pleased at your advancement than I, and if you should be placed in my position and I put subordinate, it would not change our relations in the least. I would make the same exertions to support you that you have ever done to support me, and I would do all in my power to make our cause win. On January 31st, Sherman wrote, I am fully aware of your friendly feeling toward me, and you may always depend on me as your steadfast supporter. Your wish is law and gospel to me, and such is the feeling that pervades my army. In all the annals of history, no correspondence between men in high station furnishes a nobler example of genuine disinterested personal friendship and exalted loyalty to a great cause. Admiral Porter had withdrawn nearly all the naval vessels from the James River in order to increase his fleet for the Fort Fisher expedition. Only three or four light gunboats were left, and one ironclad, the Onondaga, a powerful double-turreted monitor carrying two 15-inch smoothbores and two 150-pound Parrot rifles. This vessel was commanded by Captain William A. Parker of the Navy. Captain Parker would occasionally pay a visit to General Grant at City Point, and he usually brought with him a junior officer who afforded the General-in-Chief no little amusement by the volubility of his conversation. When the General asked the Captain a question, before he could venture a reply, his sub would volunteer an answer, and frequently make it the occasion of an elaborate lecture upon the intricate science of marine warfare. The captain could rarely get in a word edgewise. In fact, he seemed to accept the situation and did not often make the attempt. It might have been said of this young officer what Talleyrand said of a French diplomat, clever man, but he has no talent for dialogue. There had been so much talk about the formidable character of the double-turreted monitors that General Grant decided one morning to go up the James and pay a visit to the Onondaga and invited me to accompany him. The monitor was lying above the pontoon bridge in Trent's Reach. After looking the vessel over and admiring the perfection of her machinery, the general said to the commander, Captain, what is the effective range of your fifteen-inch smooth bores? About eighteen hundred yards with their present elevation, was the reply. The general looked up the river and added, There is a battery which is just about that distance from us. Suppose you take a shot at it and see what you can do. The gun was promptly brought into position by revolving the turret, accurate aim taken, and the order given to fire. There was a tremendous concussion, followed by a deafening roar as the enormous shell passed through the air, and then all eyes were strained to see what execution would be done by the shot. The huge mass struck directly within the battery and exploded. A cloud of smoke arose, earth and splintered logs flew in every direction, and a number of the garrison sprang over the parapet. The general took another puff at the cigar he was smoking, nodded his head and said, Good shot. The naval officers indulged in broad smiles of triumph and tried to look as if this was only one of the little things they always did with equal success when they tried hard. On the night of January 23rd, a naval officer, at General Grant's suggestion, was sent up to plant torpedoes at the obstructions which had been placed in the river at Trent's Reach, as he was apprehensive that our depleted naval force might be attacked by the enemy's fleet, which was lying in the river near Richmond. The officer made the discovery that the Confederate ironclads were quietly moving down the river. News of their approach was promptly given, and at once telegraphed to headquarters. The enemy's fleet consisted of six vessels, and by half-past ten o'clock they had passed the upper end of Dutch Gap Canal. The general directed me and another staff officer to take boats and communicate with all dispatch with certain naval vessels, warn them of the character of the anticipated attack, and direct them to move up and make a determined effort to prevent the enemy's fleet from reaching City Point. The officer whom I was to take with me got a little rattled in the hurry of the departure, and started, from force of habit, to put on his spurs. It took me some time to persuade him that these appendages to his heels would not particularly facilitate his movements in climbing aboard gunboats. A third officer, Lieutenant Dunn, was sent to communicate with a gunboat stationed at some distance from the others. In the meantime, orders were given to tow coal schooners up the river, ready to sink them in the channel if necessary.
and instructions were issued to move all heavy guns within reach down to the river shore, where their fire could command the channel. There was an enormous accumulation of supplies at City Point, and their destruction at this time would have been a serious embarrassment. The night was pitch dark, but our naval vessels were promptly reached by means of steam tugs, and their commanders, who displayed that cordial spirit of cooperation always manifested by our sister service, expressed an eagerness to obey General Grant's orders as implicitly as if he had been their admiral. Most of these vessels were out of repair and almost unserviceable, but their officers were determined to make the best fight they could. When I returned to headquarters, the general, Mrs. Grant, and Ingalls were talking the matter over in the front room of the general's quarters. Well, now that we've got all ready for them, said Ingalls, why don't their old gunboats come down? Ingalls, you must have patience, remarked the general. Perhaps they don't know that you're in such a hurry for them, or they would move faster. You must give them time. Well, if they're going to postpone their movement indefinitely, I'll go to bed, continued Ingalls, and started for his quarters. News now came that it was thought the vessels could not pass the obstructions and would not make the attempt, and the general and Mrs. Grant retired to their sleeping apartment, orders being left that the general was to be wakened if there should be any change in the situation. Soon after one o'clock word came that the enemy's vessels had succeeded at high water in getting through the obstructions. A loud knock was now given upon the door of the general's sleeping room. He called out instantly, Yes, what have you heard? The reply was, The gunboats have passed the obstructions and are coming down. In about two minutes, the general came hurriedly into the office. He had drawn on his top boots over his drawers and put on his uniform frock coat, the skirt of which reached about to the tops of the boots and made up for the absence of trousers. He lighted a cigar while listening to the reports and then sat down at his desk and wrote out orders in great haste. The puffs from the cigar were now as rapid as those of the engine of an express train at full speed. Mrs. Grant soon after came in and was anxious to know about the situation. It was certainly an occasion upon which a woman's curiosity was entirely justifiable. Dunn had returned with a report about the movement of the gunboat with which he had been sent to communicate, and Ingalls had also rejoined the party. Mrs. Grant, in the midst of the scene, quietly said, Ulyss, will those gunboats shell the bluff? Well, I think all their time will be occupied in fighting our naval vessels and the batteries ashore, he replied. The Onondaga ought to be able to sink them, but I don't know what they would do if they should get down this far. Just then, news came in that upon the approach of the enemy's vessels, the Onondaga had retired down the river. The captain had lost his head, and under pretense of trying to obtain a more advantageous position, had turned tail with his vessel and moved downstream below the pontoon bridge. General Grant's indignation knew no bounds when he heard of this retreat. He said, I have been thrown into close contact with the Navy, both on the Mississippi River and upon the Atlantic coast. I entertain the highest regard for the intrepidity of the officers of that service, and it is an inexpressible mortification to think that the captain of so formidable an ironclad, and the only one of its kind we have in the river, should fall back at such a critical moment. Why, it was the great chance of his life to distinguish himself. Additional instructions were at once telegraphed to the shore batteries to act with all possible vigor. Mrs. Grant, who was one of the most composed of those present, now drew her chair a little nearer to the general, and with her mild voice inquired, Ulyss, what had I better do? The general looked at her for a moment and then replied in a half-serious and half-teasing way, Well, the fact is, Julia, you oughtn't to be here. Dunn now spoke up and said, Let me have the ambulance hitched up and drive Mrs. Grant back into the country far enough to be out of reach of the shells. Oh, their gunboats are not down here yet, answered the general, and they must be stopped at all hazards. Additional dispatches were sent, and a fresh cigar was smoked, the puffs of which showed even an increased rapidity. In about two hours it was reported that only one of the enemy's boats was below the obstructions, 
and the rest were above, apparently aground. More guns had by this time been placed in the shore batteries, and the situation was greatly relieved. Ingalls, whose dry humor always came to his rescue when matters were serious, again assumed an air of disappointment and said, I tell you, I'm getting out of all patience, and I've about made up my mind that these boats never intended to come down here anyhow, that they've just been playing it on us to keep us out of bed. A little while after matters had so quieted down that the general-in-chief and Mrs. Grant retired to finish their interrupted sleep. At daylight, the Onondaga moved up within 900 yards of the Confederate ironclad Virginia, the flagship, and opened fire upon her. Some of the shore guns were also trained upon her, and a general pounding began. She was struck about 130 times, our 15-inch shells doing much damage. Another vessel, the Richmond, was struck a number of times, and a third, the Drury, and a torpedo launch were destroyed. At flood tide, the enemy succeeded in getting their vessels afloat and withdrew up the river. That night they came down again and attacked the Onondaga, but retread after meeting with a disastrous fire from that vessel and our batteries on the river banks. This was the last service performed by the enemy's fleet in the James River. On the morning of January 24th, breakfast in the mess room was a little later than usual, as everyone had been trying to make up for the sleep lost the previous night. When the chief had lighted his cigar after the morning meal and taken his place by the campfire, a staff officer said, General, I never saw cigars consumed quite so rapidly as those you smoked last night when you were writing dispatches to head off the ironclads. He smiled and remarked, No, when I come to think of it, those cigars didn't last very long, did they? An allusion was then made to the large number he had smoked the second day of the Battle of the Wilderness. In reply to this, he said, I had been a very light smoker previous to the attack on Donelson, and after that battle I acquired a fondness for cigars by reason of a purely accidental circumstance. Admiral Foote, commanding the fleet of gunboats which were cooperating with the army, had been wounded, and at his request I had gone aboard his flagship to confer with him. The admiral offered me a cigar, which I smoked on my way back to my headquarters. On the road I was met by a staff officer, who announced that the enemy were making a vigorous attack. I galloped forward at once, and while riding among the troops giving directions for repulsing the assault, I carried the cigar in my hand. It had gone out, but it seems that I continued to hold the stump between my fingers throughout the battle. In the accounts published in the papers, I was represented as smoking a cigar in the midst of the conflict, and many persons, thinking, no doubt, that tobacco was my chief solace, sent me boxes of the choicest brands from everywhere in the North. As many as ten thousand were soon received. I gave away all I could get rid of, but having such a quantity on hand, I naturally smoked more than I would have done under ordinary circumstances, and I have continued the habit ever since. General Grant never mentioned, however, one incident in connection with the Battle of Donelson, and no one ever heard of it until it was related by his opponent in that battle, General Buckner. In a speech made by that officer at a banquet given in New York on the anniversary of General Grant's birthday, April 27, 1889, he said, Under these circumstances, sir, I surrendered to General Grant. I had at a previous time befriended him, and it has been justly said that he never forgot an act of kindness. I met him on the boat, and he followed me when I went to my quarters. He left the officers of his own army and followed me, with that modest manner peculiar to himself, into the shadow, and there tendered me his purse. It seems to me, Mr. Chairman, that in the modesty of his nature he was afraid the light would witness that act of generosity, and sought to hide it from the world. We can appreciate that, sir. On the morning of the 31st of January, General Grant received a letter sent in on the Petersburg front the day before, signed by the Confederates Alexander H. Stevens, J. A. Campbell, and R. M. T. Hunter, asking permission to come through our lines. These gentlemen constituted the celebrated Peace Commission, and were on their way to endeavor to have a conference with Mr. Lincoln. The desired permission to enter our lines was granted, and Babcock was sent to meet them and escort them to City Point.
Some time after dark the train which brought them arrived and they came at once to headquarters. General Grant was writing in his quarters when a knock came upon the door. In obedience to his, come in, the party entered and were most cordially received, and a very pleasant conversation followed. Stevens was the vice president of the Confederacy. Campbell, a former justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, was assistant secretary of war, and Hunter was president pro tempore of the Confederate Senate. As General Grant had been instructed from Washington to keep them at City Point until further orders, he conducted them in person to the headquarters steamer, the Mary Martin, which was lying at the wharf, made them his guests, and had them provided with well-furnished staterooms and comfortable meals during their stay. They were treated with every possible courtesy, their movements were not restrained, and they passed part of the time upon the boat, and part of it at headquarters. Stevens was about five feet five inches in height, his complexion was sallow, and his skin seemed shriveled upon his bones. He possessed intellect enough, however, for the whole commission. Many pleasant conversations occurred with him at headquarters, and an officer once remarked after the close of an interview, the Lord seems to have robbed that man's body of nearly all its flesh and blood to make brains of them. The commissioners twice endeavored to draw General Grant out as to his ideas touching the proper conditions of the proposed terms of peace, but as he considered himself purely a soldier, not entrusted with any diplomatic functions, and as the commissioners spoke of negotiations between the two governments, while the general was not willing to acknowledge even by an inference any government within our borders except that of the United States, he avoided the subject entirely. Except to let it be known by his remarks that he would gladly welcome peace if it could be secured upon proper terms. Mr. Lincoln had directed Mr. Seward, the Secretary of State, on January 31st to meet the commissioners at Fort Monroe on February 2nd. General Grant telegraphed the President that he thought the gentlemen were sincere in their desire to restore peace and union, and that it would have a bad effect if they went back without any expression from one who was in authority, and said he would feel sorry if Mr. Lincoln did not have an interview with them, or with some of them. This changed the President's mind, and he started at once for Fort Monroe. The commissioners were sent down the James River that afternoon, and were met at Fort Monroe by the President and Mr. Seward on the 3D, and had a conference lasting several hours aboard the President's steamer. Mr. Lincoln stated that peace could be secured only by a restoration of the national authority over all the states, a recognition of the position assumed by him as to the abolition of slavery, and an understanding that there should be no cessation of hostilities short of an end of the war and a disbanding of all forces hostile to the government. The commissioners, while they did not declare positively that they would not consent to reunion, avoided giving their assent, and as they seemed to desire to postpone that important question and adopt some other course first, which might possibly lead in the end to union, but which Mr. Lincoln and Mr. Seward thought would amount simply to an indefinite postponement, the conference ended without result. After stopping at City Point and having another conversation with General Grant, principally in reference to an exchange of prisoners, the Confederate commissioners were escorted through our lines on their way back to Richmond. I accompanied the escort part of the way and had an interesting talk with Mr. Stevens. He was evidently greatly disappointed at the failure of the conference, but was prudent enough not to talk much about it. He spoke freely in regard to General Grant, saying, We all form our preconceived ideas of men of whom we have heard a great deal, and I had certain definite notions as to the appearance and character of General Grant, but I was never so completely surprised in all my life as when I met him and found him a person so entirely different from my idea of him. His spare figure, simple manners, lack of all ostentation, extreme politeness, and charm of conversation were a revelation to me, for I had pictured him as a man of a directly opposite type of character and expected to find in him only the bluntness of the soldier. Notwithstanding the fact that he talks so well, it is plain that he has more brains than tongue. He continued by saying what he said several times in Washington after the war, and also wrote in his memoirs, He is one of the most remarkable men I ever met.
He does not seem to be aware of his powers, but in the future he will undoubtedly exert a controlling influence in shaping the destinies of the country. Mr. Stevens was wrapped from his eyes to his heels in a coarse gray overcoat about three sizes too large for him, with a collar so high that it threatened to lift his hat off every time he leaned his head back. This coat, together with his complexion, which was as yellow as a ripe ear of corn, gave rise to a characterization of the costume by Mr. Lincoln which was very amusing. The next time he saw General Grant at City Point, after the peace conference, he said to him, in speaking on the subject, Did you see Stevens's great coat? Oh, yes, answered the general. Well, continued Mr. Lincoln, soon after we assembled on the steamer at Hampton Roads, the cabin began to get pretty warm, and Stevens stood up and pulled off his big coat. He peeled it off just about as you would husk an ear of corn. I couldn't help thinking, as I looked first at the coat and then at the man, well, that's the biggest shuck and the littlest nubbin I ever did see. This story became one of the general's favorite anecdotes, and he often related it in after years with the greatest zest. Chapter 24 Grant plans the spring campaigns. The president's son joins Grant's staff. Lee asks a personal interview, a visionary peace program, high prices in Richmond. Grant receives a medal from Congress, shaving under difficulties. Arrival of Sheridan's Scouts. General Grant was at this time employing all his energies in maturing his plans for a comprehensive campaign on the part of all the armies, with a view to ending the war in the early spring. Sheridan was to move down the Valley of Virginia for the purpose of destroying the railroads, the James River Canal, and the factories in that section of country used for the production of munitions of war. Stoneman was to start upon a raid from East Tennessee with 4,000 men with a view to breaking up the enemy's communications in that direction. Canby, who was in command at New Orleans, was to advance against Mobile, Montgomery, and Selma. In the movement on Mobile, Canby had at least 45,000 men. Thomas was to send a large body of cavalry under Wilson into Alabama. The movements of our forces in the West were intended not only to destroy communications, but to keep the Confederate troops there from being sent east to operate against Sherman. Sherman was to march to Columbia, South Carolina, thence to Fayetteville, North Carolina, and afterward in the direction of Goldsboro. Schofield was to be transferred from Tennessee to Annapolis, Maryland, and thence by steamer to the Cape Fear River for the purpose of moving inland from there and joining Sherman in North Carolina. Schofield's orders were afterward changed, and he rendezvoused at Alexandria, Virginia, instead of Annapolis. The Army of the Potomac and the Army of the James were to watch Lee, and at the proper time, strike his army a crushing blow, or, if he should suddenly retreat, to pursue him and inflict upon him all damage possible, and to endeavor to head off and prevent any portion of his army from reaching North Carolina as an organized force capable of forming a junction with Johnston and opposing Sherman. Some of these operations were delayed longer than was expected, and a few changes were made in the original plan, but they were all carried into effect with entire success, and the military ability of the general-in-chief never appeared to better advantage than in directing these masterly movements, which covered a theater of war greater than that of any campaigns in modern history, and which required a grasp and comprehension which have rarely been possessed even by the greatest commanders. He was at this period indefatigable in his labors, and he once wrote in a single day forty-two important dispatches with his own hand. In the latter part of January, General Grant went with Schofield down the coast and remained there a short time to give personal directions on the ground. Sherman entered Columbia February 17th, and the garrison of Charleston evacuated that place on the 18th without waiting to be attacked. When this news was received, Dr. Craven, a medical officer who was in the habit of drawing all his similes from his own profession, commended the movement by saying, General Sherman applied a remedial agency which is in entire accord with the best medical practice. Charleston was suffering from the disease known as secession, and he got control of it by means of counter-irritation. Wilmington was captured on the 22nd of February. An addition was now made to our staff in the person of Captain Robert T. Lincoln, the President's eldest son. He had been graduated at Harvard University in 1864, 
and had at once urged his father to let him enter the army and go to the front. But Mr. Lincoln felt that this would only add to his own personal anxieties, and Robert was persuaded to remain at Harvard and take a course of study in the law school. The fact is not generally known that Mr. Lincoln already had a personal representative in the army. He had procured a man to enlist early in the war, whom he always referred to as his substitute. This soldier served in the field to the end with a good record, and the president watched his course with great interest and took no little pride in him. In the spring of 1865, Robert renewed his request to his father, who mentioned the subject to General Grant. The general said to the president that if he would let Robert join the staff at headquarters, he would be glad to give him a chance to see some active service in the field. The president replied that he would consent to this upon one condition, that his son should serve as a volunteer aide without pay or emoluments. But Grant dissuaded him from adhering to that determination, saying that it was due to the young man that he should be regularly commissioned and put on an equal footing with other officers of the same grade. So it was finally settled that Robert should receive the rank of captain and assistant adjutant general, and on February 23rd he was attached to the staff of the general-in-chief. The new acquisition to the company at headquarters soon became exceedingly popular. He had inherited many of the genial traits of his father and entered heartily into all the social pastimes at headquarters. He was always ready to perform his share of hard work and never expected to be treated differently from any other officer on account of his being the son of the chief executive of the nation. The experience acquired by him in the field did much to fit him for the position of Secretary of War, which he afterward held. This month had brought me another promotion. I received a commission as Brevet Colonel of Volunteers, dated February 24th, for faithful and meritorious services. On the evening of March 3rd, just as the general was starting to the mess hut for dinner, a communication was handed to him from General Lee, which had come through our lines, and was dated the day before. After referring to a recent meeting under a flag of truce between Ord and Longstreet, from which the impression was derived that General Grant would not refuse to see him, if he had authority to act for the purpose of attempting to bring about an adjustment of the present difficulties by means of a military convention, the letter went on to say, Sincerely desiring to leave nothing untried which may put an end to the calamities of war, I propose to meet you at such convenient time and place as you may designate, with the hope that, upon an interchange of views, it may be found practicable to submit the subjects of controversy between the belligerents to a convention of the kind mentioned. In such event, I am authorized to do whatever the result of the proposed interview may render necessary or advisable. There came enclosed with this letter another stating that General Lee feared there was some misunderstanding about the exchange of political prisoners, and saying that he hoped that at the interview proposed some satisfactory solution of that matter might be arrived at. General Grant, not being vested with any authority whatever to treat for peace, at once telegraphed the contents of the communication to the Secretary of War and asked for instructions. The dispatch was submitted to Mr. Lincoln at the Capitol, where he had gone, according to the usual custom at the closing hours of the session of Congress, in order to act promptly upon bills presented to him. He consulted with the Secretaries of State and War, and then wrote with his own hand a reply, dated midnight, which was signed by Stanton, and forwarded to General Grant. It was received the morning of the 4th and read as follows. The President directs me to say to you that he wishes you to have no conference with General Lee unless it be for the capitulation of General Lee's army or on some minor and purely military matter. He instructs me to say that you are not to decide, discuss, or confer upon any political question. Such questions the President holds in his own hands and will submit them to no military conferences or conventions. Meantime, you are to press to the utmost your military advantages. The general thought that the president was unduly anxious about the manner in which the affair would be treated, and replied at once, I can assure you that no act of the enemy will prevent me from pressing all advantages gained to the utmost of my ability. Neither will I, under any circumstances, exceed my authority or in any way embarrass the government. It was because I had no right to meet General Lee on the subject proposed by him that I referred the matter for instructions 
He then replied to Lee, In regard to meeting you on the sixth instant, I would state that I have no authority to accede to your proposition for a conference on the subject proposed. Such authority is vested in the President of the United States alone. General Ord could only have meant that I would not refuse an interview on any subject on which I have a right to act, which, of course, would be such as are purely of a military character, and on the subject of exchanges which has been entrusted to me. It was learned afterward that an interesting but rather fanciful program had been laid out by the enemy as a means to be used in restoring peace, and that this contemplated interview between Grant and Lee was to be the opening feature. Jefferson Davis had lost the confidence of his people to such an extent as a director of military movements that Lee had been made generalissimo and given almost dictatorial powers as to war measures. As the civilians had failed to bring about peace, it was resolved to put Lee forward in an effort to secure it upon some terms which the South could accept without too great a sacrifice of its dignity by means of negotiations, which were to begin by a personal interview with General Grant. One proposition discussed was that after the meeting of Grant and Lee, at which peace should be urged upon terms of granting amnesty, making some compensation for the emancipated slaves, etc., by the national government, it should be arranged to have Mrs. Longstreet, who had been an old friend of Mrs. Grant, visit her at City Point, and after that to try and induce Mrs. Grant to visit Richmond. It was taken for granted that the natural chivalry of the soldiers would assure such cordial and enthusiastic greetings to these ladies that it would arouse a general sentiment of goodwill, which would everywhere lead to demonstrations in favor of peace between the two sections of the country. General Longstreet says that the project went so far that Mrs. Longstreet, who was at Lynchburg, was telegraphed to come on to Richmond. The plan outlined in this order of procedure was so visionary that it seems strange that it could ever have been seriously discussed by anyone. But it must be remembered that the condition of the Confederacy was then desperate, and that drowning men catch at straws. It was seen that Grant, by his operations, was rapidly forcing the fight to a finish. The last white man in the South had been put into the ranks, the communications were broken, the supplies were irregular, Confederate money was at a fabulous discount, and hope had given place to despair. The next evening, one of our scouts returned from a trip to Richmond, and was brought to headquarters in order that the general-in-chief might question him in person. The man said, The depreciation in the purchasing power of graybacks, as we call the rebel treasury notes, is so rapid that every time I go into the enemy's lines, I have to increase my supply of them. On my last trip I had to stuff my clothes full of their currency to keep myself going for even a couple of days. A barrel of flour in Richmond now costs over a thousand dollars, and a suit of clothes about twelve hundred. A dollar in gold is equal in value to a hundred dollars in graybacks. Then so much counterfeit Confederate money has been shoved in through our lines that in the country places they don't pretend to make any difference between good and bad money. A fellow that had come in from the western part of the state told me a pretty tough yarn about matters out there. He said, Everything that has a picture on it goes for money. If you stop at a hotel and the bill of fare happens to have an engraving of the house printed at the top, you can just tear off the picture and pay for your dinner with it. On the 10th of March, the under Elihu B. Washburn, who had paid one or two visits before to headquarters, arrived at City Point and brought with him the medal which had been struck, in accordance with an act of Congress, in recognition of General Grant's services, and which Mr. Washburn had been commissioned to present. A dozen prominent ladies and gentlemen from Washington came at the same time. On the afternoon of the next day, General Grant went with them to the lines of the Army of the Potomac and gave orders for a review of some of the troops. That evening, some simple arrangements were made for the presentation of the medal, which took place at 8 p.m. in the main cabin of the steamer, which had brought the visitors, and which was lying at the City Point Wharf. General Meade suggested that he and the Corps commanders would like to witness the ceremony, and in response to an invitation, they came to City Point for the purpose, accompanied by a large number of their staff officers. Mr. Washburn arose at the appointed hour 
and after delivering an exceedingly graceful speech, eulogistic of the illustrious services for which Congress had awarded this testimonial of the nation's gratitude and appreciation, he took the medal from the handsome Morocco case in which it was enclosed and handed it to the general-in-chief. The general, who had remained standing during the presentation speech, with his right hand clasping the lapel of his coat, received the medal and expressed his appreciation of the gift in a few well-chosen words, but uttered with such modesty of manner and in so low a tone of voice that they were scarcely audible. A military band was in attendance, and at the suggestion of Mrs. Grant a dance was now improvised. The officers soon selected their partners from among the ladies present, and the evening's entertainment was continued to a late hour. The general was urged to indulge in a waltz, but from this he begged off. However, he finally agreed to compromise the matter by dancing a square dance. He went through the cotillion, not as gracefully as some of the beaux among the younger officers present, but did his part exceedingly well, barring the impossibility of his being able to keep exact time with the music. He did not consider dancing his forte, and in afterlife seldom indulged in that form of amusement, unless upon some occasion when he attended a ball given in his honor. In such case he felt that he had to take part in the opening dance to avoid appearing impolite or unappreciative. Mr. Washburn was assigned quarters in camp next to General Grant. The next day was Sunday. The congressman was the first one up, and when he went to shave he found there was no looking-glass in his quarters, so he stepped across to the general's office in his shirt-sleeves, and finding a glass there, proceeded to lather his face and prepare for the delicate operation of removing his beard. Just as he had taken hold of his nose with his left thumb and forefinger, which he had converted into a sort of clothes-pin for the occasion, and had scraped a wide swath down his right cheek with the razor, the front door of the hut was suddenly burst open, and a young woman rushed in, fell on her knees at his feet and cried, Save him! Oh, save him! He's my husband! The distinguished member of Congress was so startled by the sudden apparition that it was with difficulty that he avoided disfiguring his face with a large gash. He turned to the intruder and said, What's all this about your husband? Come, get up, get up. I don't understand you. Oh, General, for God's sake, do save my husband, continued the woman. Why, my good woman, I'm not General Grant, the congressman insisted. Yes, you are. They told me this was your room. Oh, save him, General. They're to shoot him this very day for desertion if you don't stop them. Mr. Washburn now began to take in the situation and led the woman to a seat and tried to comfort her while she began to tell how her young husband had been led, through his fondness for her, to desert in order to go home and see her, and how he had been captured and court-martialed and was to be executed that day and how she had heard of it only in time to reach headquarters that morning to plead for his life. By this time the general was up, and hearing from his sleeping apartment an excited conversation in the front room, dressed hurriedly, and stepped upon the scene in time to hear the burden of the woman's story. The spectacle presented partook decidedly of the serio-comic. The dignified member of Congress was standing in his shirt-sleeves in front of the pleading woman, his face covered with lather, except the swath which had been made down his right cheek. The razor was uplifted in his hand, and the tears were starting out of his eyes as his sympathies began to be worked upon. The woman was screaming and gesticulating frantically, and was almost hysterical with grief. I appeared at the front door about the same time that the general entered from the rear, and it was hard to tell whether one ought to laugh or cry at the sight presented. The general now took a hand in the matter, convinced the woman that he was the commanding general, assured her that he would take steps at once to have her husband reprieved and pardoned, and sent her away rejoicing. His interposition saved the man's life just in the nick of time. He cracked many a joke with Mr. Washburn afterward about the figure he cut on the morning of the occurrence. Sheridan had started out from Winchester on the 27th of February with nearly 10,000 cavalry, on March 5th, news was received that he had struck Early's forces between Staunton and Charlottesville and crushed his entire command, compelling Early and other officers to take refuge in houses and in the woods.
For some time thereafter, only contradictory reports were heard from Sheridan, through the Richmond papers which came into our hands, and as he was in the heart of the enemy's country, and direct communication was cut off, it was difficult to ascertain the facts. General Grant felt no apprehension as to the result of Sheridan's movements, but was anxious to get definite reports. On Sunday evening, March 12th, the members of the mess sat down to dinner about dark. Mrs. Grant and Mrs. Rawlins, who was also visiting headquarters, were at the table. Toward the end of the meal, the conversation turned upon Sheridan, and all present expressed the hope that we might soon hear something from him in regard to the progress of his movements. Just then, a colored waiter stepped rapidly into the mess room and said to the general, Thou's a man outside that say he want to see you right away, and he don't peer to want to see nobody else. What kind of looking man is he? asked the general. Why, said the servant, he's de most dreffly looking bein' I ever laid eyes on. He peers to me like he was a outcast. With the general's consent, I left the table and went to see who the person was. I found a man outside who was about to sink to the ground from exhaustion, and who had scarcely strength enough to reply to my questions. He had on a pair of soldier's trousers three or four inches too short, and a blouse three sizes too large. He was without a hat, and his appearance was grotesque in the extreme. With him was another man in about the same condition. After giving them some whiskey, they gathered strength enough to state that they were scouts sent by Sheridan from Columbia on the James River, had passed through the enemy's lines, bringing with them a long and important dispatch from their commander, had ridden hard for two days, and had had a particularly rough experience in getting through to our lines. Their names were J. A. Campbell and A. H. Rowand, Jr. As Campbell had the dispatch in his possession, I told him to step into the mess room with me and hand it to the general in person, so as to comply literally with his instructions, knowing the general's anxiety to have the news at once. The message was written on tissue paper and enclosed in a ball of tie foil, which the scout had carried in his mouth. The general glanced over it and then read it aloud to the party at the dinner table. It consisted of about three pages and gave a vivid account of Sheridan's successful march and the irreparable damage he had inflicted upon the enemy's communications, saying that he had captured twenty-eight pieces of artillery, destroyed many mills and factories, the James River Canal for a distance of fifteen miles, and the bridges on the Ravana River, and stating that he was going to destroy the canal still further the next day, and then move on the Central and the Fredericksburg Railroads, tear them up, and afterward march to White House, where he would like to have forage and rations sent him, and notifying the general that his purpose, unless otherwise ordered, was then to join the Army of the Potomac. The general proceeded to interrogate Campbell, but the ladies, who had now become intensely interested in the scout, also began to ply him with questions, which were directed at him so thick and fast that he soon found himself in the situation of the outstretched human figure in the almanac, fired at with arrows from every sign of the zodiac. The general soon rose from his seat and said good-naturedly, Well, I will never get the information I want from this scout, as long as you ladies have him under cross-examination, and I think I had better take him over to my quarters and see if I cannot have him to myself for a little while. By this time the dinner party was pretty well broken up, and by direction of the general several members of the staff accompanied him and the scouts to the general's quarters. It was learned from them that Sheridan, deeming it very important to get a dispatch through to headquarters, selected two parties, consisting each of two scouts. To each party was given a copy of the dispatch, and each was left to select its own route. Campbell and Rowand started on horseback from Columbia on the evening of the 10th, following the roads on the north side of Richmond. They were twice overhauled by parties of the enemy, but they represented themselves as belonging to Imboden's cavalry, and being in Confederate uniforms and skilled in the southern dialect, they escaped without detection. When they approached the Chickahominy, they were met by two men and a boy, with whom they fell into conversation, and were told by them that they had better not cross the river, as there were Yankee troops on the other side. Before the scouts were out of earshot, 
they heard one of the men say to the other, I believe those fellows are D, D Yankees. And soon they found that the alarm had been given and the Confederate cavalry were pursuing them. They rode forward to the Chickahominy as rapidly as they could proceed in the jaded condition of their horses, and when they reached the stream they took off everything except their undershirts, tied their clothes on the pommels of their saddles, and swam their horses across the river. Campbell had taken the roll of tinfoil which contained the dispatch from the lining of his boot and put it in his mouth. On the other side of the stream they found a steep, muddy bank and a row of piles. As the horses could not struggle out, the men abandoned them and got into a canoe which providentially happened to be floating past and by this means got ashore. The Confederates by this time had opened fire on them from the opposite bank. The scouts made their way on foot for eleven miles, in their almost naked condition, to Harrison's Landing on the James River, where they met a detachment of our troops. The soldiers supplied them with trousers and blouses, such as they could spare, and took them by boat to City Point. They had ridden one hundred and forty-five miles without sleep, and with but little food. The second pair of scouts sent by Sheridan made their way by canal and on foot to the south of Richmond. After six unsuccessful attempts to get across the lines, one of them reached headquarters several days later. The scouts were given a meal of the best food of which the headquarters mess could boast and put into a comfortable hut where they lost no time in making up for lost sleep. The next day, General Grant made all preparation for sending supplies and troops to meet Sheridan at White House. The general complimented the scouts warmly upon their success, directed that they be supplied with two good horses and an outfit of clothing, and sent them around to White House on a steamer to await Sheridan there. But on their arrival they could not restrain their spirit of adventure and rode out through the enemy's country in the direction of the South Anna River until they met their commander. Campbell was only nineteen years of age. Sheridan always addressed him as boy, and the history of his many hairbreadth escapes that year would fill a volume. Campbell has always remained a scout and is still in the employ of the government in that capacity at Fort Cooster. Rowand is now a prominent lawyer in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This day, March 13th, possesses a peculiar personal interest for me, for the reason that it is the date borne by two brevet appointments I received, one of colonel and the other of brigadier general in the regular army, for gallant and meritorious services in the field during the rebellion.